morning, ready to praise God this morning? Do you love Jesus this morning? Well, come on, let's give Him everything we got. Let's praise the name of the Lord our God. See you. 
from the cloud you speak what was there now we see Jesus the
serve the Lord our God. God the Creator becomes personal. That we can speak to Him, that we can approach Him. The Bible talks about He exists in unapproachable light. Yet as humans, we're able to approach Him. That's good because we've got a whole lot of needs this morning to ask God for help. All kinds of different people that need healing and provision and there's people in jail that need help. Someone's needing favor in there. There's people that email all the way through the Hillsong television program. And so we get emails from all around the world, plus people here this morning, people there in Hobart and in Darwin, Brisbane. So wherever you are, we're going to have them scrolling behind. You might want to pick one, but wherever you are today, why don't uh, Emma and Kent and uh, maybe uh, Andrew, why don't you guys jump on stage there in your locations and just hold these prayer requests up. Can we all pray? this morning. Can we seek God today? Come on, can you stretch your hand out towards these requests? Jesus, you are the Lord, our God. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're the Lord who provides. You're Rapha. You're the one who heals. You're St. Kenu. You're the righteousness. You're the one who sets things right, makes things right. And we ask today with all of these requests, God, that you would bless, that you would favour, that you would help, that you would pour out your goodness and your grace. We present every need to you, every person to you. God, we ask now in Jesus' name that you would help people, that you would turn situations around. We present them all to you with great faith, with great expectation, with a confidence that comes with relationship with you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Welcome to church this morning. Welcome to church. It's great to have you here. People celebrating 
wedding anniversary, someone's been married for 38 years. Bill and Talia. Oh, it's Bill and Talia Danzi. Congratulations. 38 years, uh, people have been healed of cancerous tumors. Wow. Um, someone's thanking God for a new job. Someone's thanking God that they were protected from a car accident. I remember that happening to me years and years ago. I don't know how I didn't get smashed up. It was miraculous. It seriously was. I just braced for the impact. And the car went down the side and it was meant to be smashing in behind me. I've got no idea, seriously no idea how it changed. Uh, someone in Hobart family coming to church in, in this service, so that's great. Uh, you should let us know, Hobart and Darwin and, and Brisbane West, let us know different things like that so that we can celebrate with you. It's so good to be in church together. So nice. After what was an amazing, amazing, amazing weekend, last weekend at Easter, and to get an extra hour of sleep last night, anybody take advantage of that? I mean, summer's over. Oh, tragic. Well, the time zone's over, but the weather's going to continue. It's good. Why don't you take a moment and say hi. Turn around and welcome someone to the church this morning. Uh, it's good to have you in church this morning. It's very nice. Wonderful. Great crowd here for the nine o'clock service. Rob, Garrett, I was, don't know why, I was standing over there and just caught my eye when we were singing, when we were worshiping the Lord. And I thought, in a crowd that is filled with so many people, it's so easy to kind of you know, sit and just settle into a crowd and become one in so many. But I felt like God's saying that there's almost like, you know when it's all cloudy and this ray of sun comes through the clouds and it's something shining. God is shining on you for this particular season. God is shining on you. And wherever you're at, you, know, you can feel like you're one in a million. There's lots and lots of people everywhere. But I feel like God is going, no, no. People are seeing it. It's good. It's great. We're in for an amazing day today. We've got Pastor Brian Houston preaching this morning. It's great to have him live in the flesh here. Last weekend he was speaking from Jerusalem, but here in Sydney, better, better place, Sydney. And then tonight we've got Scott Sanger Samways. Yeah, we do. And don't forget, at night, we have one service at 6 p.m. Well, it's two services at 6 p.m., but it's here and next door in the Hub Auditorium. And so you can choose whichever one, that one, this one, but it's the same service. We've got live praise and worship and everything happening there and live here. Everything's live and it's just the preaching. The preaching could be there, it could be here, but it's pretty much here at Hills, all right? So you just pick whichever building that you can get into, depending on what time you come. And let's just make it an awesome win tonight, which would be great. Robert Ferguson is going to come and encourage us around our giving this morning. Let's get ready. In Brisbane, Joel. Darwin, Hobart. Hello, wonderful people. How are you? Well, as Joel said, let's get ready to give both here at Hills and there in Darwin, Hobart and Brisbane West. So good. Maybe you've given during the week, but why don't you find the blue envelopes as well? and hold them as a sign of solidarity so that we can worship together. And while you're just filling in the details, let me just tell you what happened yesterday. I was playing with my grandchildren and pulled a muscle in my right side. I didn't know that the muscle existed until I pulled it. But I did all the way through the night, couldn't sleep. Every time I turned over, it hurt. And then the morning, my left shoulder is hurting because that's how the body works. When one per part hurts, the rest of the parts hurt. We compensate. And that's the image that Paul uses in Corinthians about the body of Christ. 
He said we're all part of a body and we've all got a part to play. When one hurts, all hurts. But think of it in the context of giving. We're all muscles. We make this thing work. Some muscles are stronger than other muscles. Some are more prominent than other muscles. But this is the key. Every muscle must pull its weight. If every muscle pulled its weight, there wouldn't be sleepless nights and lots of pain. You know, tithing, bringing our gift, our tenth of our increase, bringing the tenth of our increase is God's economic strategy for a healthy body. If everybody in the church of Jesus Christ pulled their weight and brought a tenth, we'd be able to do what God wants us to do. It's not rocket science, simple biology. Amen? Why don't you take those gifts in your hands? Father God, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful church. Bless every sing single person. Bless them, Hobart, Brisbane West, Darwin, everyone here in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. As we receive that giving, why don't we check out church news? people and to treat them as beautiful sons and daughters that's growing up in God. God wants maturity in the house. Amen. We have to keep believing God to stretch us and to keep stepping into the untried, the unproven, the unknown. Imagine the hundreds and the thousands having access to a church who can be Christ to them. Here we are, New Testament people with a new covenant and we can look at these things through the power of Christ. We believe you breathe your life into your church across our nation and across the globe. It is a resource that will change the life of not only leaders who want to impact the lives of other women and people around them, but it will also change the lives of individual wives, mothers, working women, um, stay-at-home moms, anybody who wants to know what it is to be a woman who is faithful to the call of God on your life. Get your hands on this book. It'll change you in an in-depth, miraculous way. There you go, Church News. I always think it's one of the greatest small ads you can see anywhere. It's incredible. So much work that the guys put into it every single week. We are connected right across the country now. And also, a big welcome to those on the Hillsong channel. It's great for you to join us here at the Hills Campus in Sydney. Let me let you know who is connecting with us, okay, around Hillsong Australia. We're here at the Hills Campus, and we are connected right now to the City Campus in both Alexandria and Waterloo. If I me mention you, you've got to... Big shout out, big stand up, turn around, do a glory twirl, do something. At uh, the Southwest Campus, there they go. The uh, GWS, Greater West, out here past us. Uh, Bondi is connected, Burwa, Chatswood, um, the Hills Chinese, Macquarie, Maryland's Northern Beaches, where I was born. Yep, yeah, big shout out. Villawood, Newcastle, Brisbane, Mount Cravat, and the City Campus there in the valley. Noosa, Gold Coast in Surfers Paradise, Burley and at Coomera, Darwin. Melbourne in the city, the east, the west and the greater west out near the airport and in Hobart and everyone is connected right now. Can we welcome everybody, say hello wherever you are. A big hello to somewhere else. We have Pastor Brian speaking in this service this morning and so we are quite fortunate. I was just saying here in the Hills campus, last week he was in Israel speaking back to us, but here today in Australia, in his hometown. Glory, glory, which is awesome. Now let, let me just explain where we're at, at the season right now in 2016. Uh, the Colour Conference Marathon 
we're kind of, it's a half marathon, okay? We only got to run a half marathon. Bobby gets to run a full marathon. But the four, the four conferences that happened here in Sydney, that's done. It's still going to go out around the rest of the world yet. And so girls, you can still be part of getting ready for next year's conference. But colour is done. Easter last weekend was done. I'm going to show you highlights reel in a second. But that's finished. Summer has just walked away from us last night. Okay, so it's a different season right now. The time zone has changed, unless you live in Queensland where the cows are. But the time zone has changed. Time zone's changed. Here's what's in front of us right now. We're on the ramp up to Hillsong Conference. Now don't freak out, don't freak out. That's, that's a good thing. We're telling you now so that it doesn't feel like a rush. We want you to walk into conference with us because we're celebrating 30 years of Hillsong Conference. And really we have youth camps, we have a staff camp, Hillsong Conference this year, we're dubbing it the church camp. It's the church camp. And so we're walking into six hot weekends. It's probably going to be more like seven this year because we're starting it with Jensen Franklin. And we go all the way through Heart for the House weekend leading into Hillsong Conference. And there's a kids conference. There's a teenagers conference. There's a mum and dad conference, adults, the rest of us. It is for the whole family. It is in the holidays. Everyone can be there and we want you to join us and get ready. So it's not too late to get organized with work and get a week off and get things ready and do whatever you're going to be to part, be part of this big church camp Hillsong conference. You're going to love it. Why don't you take a look at this on the screens? Easter last weekend beat all our records, all our expectations. We are so grateful to God together and check the attendance records and some of the salvation records and, and the killer of kindness that went out to the community. Take a look at this together. Last weekend, Easter, Hillsong Church. opportunity as a believer to be here. And yet everywhere we go, we see signs that make me think of only they knew. The only sign we want to have to all people everywhere, that in this upside down world, there is a welcome home to the promise and the purpose of God. <laughs> Come on, isn't that amazing? The cross really does equal love. We're so grateful. We're so grateful to God. So many people impacted and the message really gone out to so many different communities even far broader than those that came to church. Millions of people would have seen the Cross Equals Love campaign. Other churches jumping on board. I had a text message from a pastor in Aubrey, Wodonga, who said, we've got Cross Equals Love in the sky down here. Did you guys organize that? And I was like, yeah, we did. We got the plane, the, the sky riding plane went from Noosa all the way down to Hobart at different points across the weekend. And this guy gets so excited about the Cross Equals Love campaign, he'll fly and do it for free even when we haven't scheduled it. If it gets cloudy, he goes, he'll, he'll do it again. And Jay's like, man, what are you doing? We didn't pay for that. We, we haven't got enough money to keep you keep flying around doing Cross Eagles Live. He goes, no, 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 it's on the house. It's on me. I am so excited about what you guys are doing. That just keeps happening. Pastor Brian's about to come and preach, and it's going to be amazing. If he does what I heard last night, it's going to be phenomenal. Seriously. We're going to sing together right across all of our campuses. So can you join us together? Let's get our hearts ready. Receive the word in Jesus' name. I see that cross, I see freedom. And I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing. Sing this out. 
When I see, when I see that cross, I see free. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will see. Hillsong Church or who's watching on today. Lord, every one of us are in different stages of life and Father, different circumstances, but what a wonderful thing to know that you're working in each of our lives, sometimes even subconsciously. Lord, you're working, you go before us, you come behind us. I pray, Father, for each person today who is here in church, those who are watching on, and I believe, Father, for your grace to be their portion again today. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen. Amen. Welcome everybody, welcome. Great to see everyone in church and great to be linked. And I'm gonna tell you that both Bobby and I leave tomorrow to go in different directions. And Bobby now has five more color conferences in three different countries and continents around the world. Uh, two continents, but three countries. And so we're gonna be praying for, no, three continents, three continents. I forgot New York. So she's away six weeks. And uh, so let's make sure that it's been a way that our prayer as a church is solidly with Bobby and the team and the color conferences to come and people get blessed in a similar way to how they have been here in Australia. I leave with a worship team this week uh, to do a worship tour in America. Uh, Hillsong Worship, 15 different cities we're going to. It's also kind of the end of my hard work towards my book. And uh, it's, it's part of uh, me basically getting that book into as many hands as possible. So again, we value your prayers. And the great thing about our church, it's never been built on one person, one ministry. And that's, you know, it's so good when I go away because, well, sometimes to be honest, things go better. It's great to look good as a pastor if you just can go away and everything gets better. And so nothing goes down. Do you know there's a lot of pastors in the world? If they're away, the crowd goes down, the giving goes down, and uh, they're like prisoners to the platform. Well, I just think maybe it's the way God's grace that church it just doesn't work like that. People know that, well, it's good that Brian's away because we get more of Robert. Ah. <laughs> uh, Robert and I are a team. We always talk about how well we spoke and cricket analogy. So, you know, sometimes you get off to a brilliant start, you're hitting sixes everywhere, then you say something dumb and you go out on 20, you know, and so much opportunity. Other times you're just solid and take some time, but you feel like you gave people a 45. That's, that's, that's pretty good, you know, and neither of us ever have had a, a century. Neither of us ever 
have a hundred. He, he would say, I have centuries. I would say he does, but we never give ourselves century. So I'm, I'm just rattling on a little, but we have an 8 a.m. service. We were both in there. And because it overlaps with this service, Robert comes here. And I asked him, I said, are you staying here for the message? He says, no. Uh, he's going over. I said, good. I said, I think the second innings is going to be better. <laughs> okay, everyone can be seated everywhere. I'm hilarious. <laughs> Caged birds and trapped fish. That's what Solomon spoke about. Caged birds and trapped fish. Both caged birds and trapped fish have no freedom, they have no future, and they're powerless. And Solomon compares life to caged birds and trapped fish. I wonder if Murphy's Law is alive and well in your psyche and your thinking when it comes to your own circumstance. I wonder if you have that sense that if it could go wrong, it will go wrong. When I was a kid, I was really good at the sack race. Wow. You know, in the sack, jumping, I was really good. I mean, I was the gun at the sack race. And it was good because I wasn't too good at many other things. And so somehow sacks made everyone equal. And so <laughs> it meant my lack of coordination. Suddenly I had a, a chance. Until my mum came when I was a little, little kid to my school to watch me in the sack race. And in the big moment with the pressure of my mother being there, I knew I could impress her. I got just a few yards, few meters along the race and had a calamity. Ended up falling over. All of a sudden, all my hopes went up in smoke. When I was in Bible college at the graduation, I was the church drummer. That's true, I was the church drummer and I was good. I mean, I was really good. Much better than these guys now. I mean, <laughs> much better. Not. <laughs> and so the graduation, just like today, Hillsong College graduations, there's lots of presentations. There was choirs and there were songs and the main presentation, I was the drummer. And the good news for me was in the presentation, the drummer had a moment where it was just the drums. I had a chance to do, ro do a roll around all the drums. And it was really, really impressive. And I practiced it a thousand times and a thousand times. I was so pleased with myself. But when the big pressure came... When the moment came, I, couldn't, I didn't just stuff up. I mean, I messed everything up. I lost my time. I lost everything. The whole song collapsed. Everything came to a grinding halt, and it was all my fault. And so the end result of that was I had to literally kick the song back in again, and it was one more step towards the end of my drumming career. So there was an Australian cyclist. I can't remember his name, and it was quite a few years ago, but he was an overwhelming uh, favorite in one of the cycling sprints on the velodrome. And of course, cycling a sprint, it's only a moment until the whole race is over. So here he is on the starting line, all of our country, and I guess the world watching him. And he, the moment, he, the moment, the split second, the hundredth of a second, he put any pressure on his pedal, his foot came unbound, undone, and his race was over. One hundredth of a second, and all those dreams and all that expectation was finished. It was gone. Well, you know, life can be a little bit like that. Stuff happens. And the truth is, it can frame the way we think. We either become filled with hope or we become fatalistic in our expectation, fatalistic in what we believe. And so Solomon, he's talking about caged birds and trapped fish. Charles Spurgeon had an entirely different perspective about birds and fish. He was a great London preacher, pastor, and he said this, as a bird cannot exhaust the air in the sky, nor a fish exhaust the water in the sea, neither can we exhaust the grace of God. He's saying, hey, there's just too much air for one bird to enjoy. There's just too much water for one fish to explore. I mean, Nemo, he managed to find his way all the way into Sydney Harbour. But the reality is there was still so much water he could have explored. He says, so is the grace of God. It is too inexhaustible for one person, for one person ever to exhaust. In other words, there's too much grace, grace to grace to grace. 
grace to grace. Too much possibility, too many miracles, too many opportunities for one believer, for one person to ever explore. I wonder if you think more like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, this is what he says. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and it's verses 11 and 12 and it's talking about time and chance. The one thing everyone gets is time and chance. Time and chance. But is chance luck and just a whatever will be type, will be type thing or is chance God-given possibility? God-given opportunity. I'll read it this time in the New Living Translation. He said, I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, he says. And he goes on and he says, the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. And then he seems to get particularly negative. Then he becomes particularly fatalistic. He says this, he says, people can never predict when hard times might come. Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. He's got this outlook that seems particularly negative. And to understand the book of Ecclesiastes, you have to understand where Solomon's mind was at, his mindset was at when he wrote or when he preached Ecclesiastes, because that's what it is. It's the preacher. Ecclesiastes is an assembly. And so he is a preacher who kind of, it would seem, lost his way. He wasn't in a good place. You understand the state of mind. You understand Ecclesiastes because in many ways in Ecclesiastes, Solomon's wisdom is anti-wisdom. In many ways, it goes against the tenor of Scripture because he keeps on talking about what's under the sun. So he's talking about the wisdom of what is under the sun. Rather than the wisdom of heaven, he's talking about the wisdom of earth here. And so much of it is anti-wisdom. And this is why. Deuteronomy 7 verse 4, the Israelites are told, don't marry pagan wives, lest you turn, they turn your heart to their God. Don't marry pagan wives lest they turn your heart. And that's exactly what Solomon had done. Of course, Solomon, he had quite a few wives. <laughs> quite a few. About a thousand. 700 to be exact. But then he had 300 concubines as well. Different days. Different days. Well, listen to it. By the way, I had a friend in Bible college who, he, he played only three chords on the guitar and he could only play one song. So he'd always pick up a guitar, he'd always play the same song with these three chords. It dashed in my mind, it went like this. King Solomon had a thousand wives, and that's the reason why. He was always late on business trips, kissing them all goodbye. <laughs> Admit, that's a great song right there. That is a great song. Those were the days when, hey, come on, let's admit, that is an awesome melody right there. Let's get to it. Solomon did exactly what Israel were told not to do. 1 Kings 11, verse 3 and 4, he had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart and after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father, David. You see what's happened here? He had literally allowed compromise to come in. His heart had turned. So now he's speaking out of a place of negativity, emptiness, futility, inevitability. And so Solomon, that's where he's speaking from in this book, in Ecclesiastes. He married brides, Egyptian brides, and he bought Egyptian horses. Remember David, his father says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But I'll remember the name of the Lord or we will remember, we, he's talking about his family, yeah. David, Solomon, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Yeah. And so Solomon, he was buying horses because of unbelief. Yeah. He was buying horses and marrying Egyptians and brokering peace with Egypt. And of course, Egypt represents a whole lot more than just Egypt. And so here he is compromising out of fear. He is buying horses because of, he, he felt the need to be protected. So that's where he is at. And it's from that place that Solomon starts to write this book. And you know, because of that, 
He kind of took on this doctrine of inevitability. I think a lot of Christians, they, they can find a feel like that. In other words, if something's wrong, I am powerless to change it. I'm like a caged bird. I'm like a trapped fish. There's nothing I can do about it. You, you, you just have the sense of resignation, acceptance in life. And I don't believe hope in God gives us any reason to just live with a sense of acceptance and resignation. I believe it gives us a reason to look forward, to look upward, get our eyes above the sun and start taking on a different wisdom, start taking on a different thinking than that thinking right there. And so if I were to read a few of these verses out of Ecclesiastes, you can see where Solomon was at. He has no real sense of hope for the future. He has this resignation about him. He says things like this. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 5, the sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. In other words, nothing ever changes. What happened yesterday is what's going to happen today. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. In other words, nothing changes. Resignation. Ecclesiastes 3.15, that which is has already been, and what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Essentially, he's saying nothing changes. My favorite is Ecclesiastes 11 verse 3. Listen to this wisdom. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth, and if a tree falls to the south or the north in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. This is the wisest man in the world. Imagine you have five minutes with the wisest man in the world and you just want one little drop, one little piece of wisdom on which you can frame your life and put all your hope for the future. And so now you have your moment and King Solomon says, if the tree falls to the south or to the north, where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Wow, thank you for that. Wow, thank you. In other words, nothing's going to change. The tree falls and that's where the tree stays. It's got no future. It's got no hope. And out from that, of course, he said even more disturbing things. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. And then he goes on and said, I hate my job. Then I hated all of my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. That's an interesting viewpoint. He said, what's the work, point of doing all this work if it just sets someone else up to win? You know, I live my life with exactly the opposite thinking. I live my life thinking my life is about building ceilings that can become the next generation's floor. That's part of what inspires me. That's part of what I, I do what I do for. It's because I want to set people up to win. And, you, and yet where he was at somehow... He saw an emptiness in that, a futility, and he keeps saying it's all vanity. In Ecclesiastes 38 times, he describes things as vanity. And in a Bible sense, this is what vanity means. Vanity is the futile emptiness of trying to be happy apart from God. The futile emptiness. And that's where Solomon was at because of his own relationship with God. That fatalistic approach comes where there is no hope and there is no God. That sense of inevitability that I'm encouraging you never to take on, never let it so suddenly seep into your spirit. Just keep your word, life based on the word and on the promise of God. And don't let that lack of faith, that lack of expectation take a hold of you. Because he talks about what's under the sun 29 times and he keeps calling it vanity. And out from that came this kind of anti-wisdom. He says, ultimately, Ecclesiastes 10, 19, a feast is made for laughter, wine makes merry, and money answers everything. So he's taking on the wisdom of what's under the sun. It's all about money. Just party up and be merry and try to give yourself a buzz that way and, uh, and get yourself drunk every night. That's kind of what he's saying in that verse. Well, I think it's sad that many people who don't know Jesus, that's where they're at. But I think it's even sadder that some people who do know Jesus, they don't have any real expectation. Sometimes people's greatest expectation is that in their difficulty, God will comfort them. And he is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the great things he does is comforts. He is the God of comfort. He's the ever-present help in trouble. 
And yet, don't finish your expectation there. Believe that God can fundamentally change things. Keep believing in the supernatural. Keep believing in miracles. Keep an expectation that God is God. He's true to His Word. And no matter how bad things are, in Him, I believe, they can only get better. <laughs> they can only get better. See, Solomon was on a journey where he was finding out the only thing that can fill a God-shaped void is God Himself. He was finding out that the only answer to his skepticism and his despair was going to come from a view that every day is a gift from God. Let's live like that, like every day is a gift from God. Because otherwise, I'll tell you what will happen. Fatal, fat, fatalistic, inevitable type mindset towards life. You'll end up negative. You'll end up skeptical. You'll end up cynical. You'll end up just thinking in futility and inevitability. You'll have no hope. You have no answer. You're a caged bird or you're a trapped fish. And to compare that to Spurgeon's outlook, oh, there's just too much air for one bird. There's too much water for one fish. There's too much grace for one person. That's a different spirit altogether. <laughs> so Solomon, the wisest man, finds himself down on wisdom, short on wisdom, and he finds himself at a point where he's disillusioned with whatever wisdom is under the sun, and that's where it changed. Ecclesiastes 12, I love the first verse because of my own testimony. Verse one says this, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. But look at this, before the difficult days come. In other words, yes, life, it has its measure. Stuff happens, tough times are a part of the journey. But if you get your foundation right, then you're all set up for the difficult times. They don't have to rule you. They don't have to frame your mind. They don't have to frame your thinking. Get yourself right with God now. Let me tell you the story. When I was 17, I was kind of caught between serving God and effectively, I was backslidden. Like most young people, I was getting pulled, temptation with the world and stuff. And it was in that thought, you know, I was like, I wanted to go to Bible college, but hey, I wasn't even really serving God well. I went to church, but mainly because the youth group had pretty girls. It's true. Well, there weren't that many pretty girls, I have to say, in New Zealand. It was, you know. <laughs> I pretty well found the one. I found the one and I married her. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop right there. So I walked into this Christian cafe, 17. I was by myself. It was run by Youth for Christ. And across the wall, I'll never forget, was a mural, took up the entire wall. It just repeated over and over, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1. Remember now your creator while you were young. Remember now your creator. It was set out from the wall and somehow God used it. I made a choice, a decision right there that had me in Bible college a few months later and changed the course of my life or set the course of my life. That one mural God used. Okay, a month or so ago, I got an email from a man called Earl Hingston. Earl's family are in our church. His own son and his grandson, Joel, is one of our great musicians, guitarists, and he's also a young theologian, and he's an awesome blessing to our college and so on. So that's his grandson. So Earl, he wrote me this email saying that many years before, he was a graphic artist in New Zealand. He told me how he was commissioned to do something with this wall in the Youth for Christ Cafe in Wellington. He said he just felt in his heart to write Remember now your creator. So he wrote it over and over, took up the whole war. But as he did it, he believed that God would use this to capture someone's heart, to change someone's life, to bring future direction. And then he told me that he had heard me preach about going into that Youth for Christ cafe, how God used that scripture to change my future. And literally, it blessed him to think that my life and basically all that's come from that had something to do with that thing that all those years before he faithfully in his day-to-day -day work just did what people do. And you know what? I cannot even begin to tell you how much that blessed me. Don't ever think your work is futility. Don't ever think there's anything about your life that God can't use in a level that you could never, ever have imagined. So he gets to the point, finally, verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
He's saying, ultimately, this is what it's all about. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Ultimately, this is humanity's all. If you live in awe of God and wonder of God, and if you live by the word of God and by the promise of God, in the Old Testament, the commandments of God, there, he said, that's what it is all about. And the, the, the wisdom that comes at the end is while you're young, so that you're ready for challenge, that's the time to build on a foundation of your creator. Well, you know, so many people, sadly, Christians, they have this negative outlook. From that comes skepticism about the supernatural and about what God can do. You start seeing believing for people to be healed as false hope. So many people who don't know Jesus, they say, don't you think you're giving people false hope? We live in a world of no hope and we don't give people false hope. What we do give them is some hope. Some hope in a world where people just aren't getting hope. It's on drip feed for some and others. This situation is hopeless. It's bleak and there's nothing in the world can change it. And I pray we will always be the kind of church who in a hopeless world, give people a sense of God breathes hope in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians, Paul speaking to Gentiles, he comes across a similar thing because people are without Christ. And this is what he says in Ephesians 2 verse 12 to 13. He said that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He talks about people being cut off from the blessing of Israel. He talks about them being strangers and aliens to the promise of God. He talks about them as being without hope and without God. He ultimately says they're a long way from God. And the wonderful thing is through Christ, what meant that they were strangers to promise, they were cut off from blessing, had been reversed. Do you know that people, if they don't know Christ, they live their lives, I think, sadly, in a place where that frames their mind, it frames their thinking. They're cut off from God's blessing. They have no expectation for God's promise. They're a long way from God. And so destiny becomes resignation. Oh, it's destiny. You just resign to it. It's acceptance. Nothing's going to change. It's destiny. With Christ, destiny becomes purpose. It becomes promise. When I think of the word destiny, I don't go, oh, I go, oh. all of a sudden, I think of destiny as purpose and hope. It's something to attach my vision to. I've now got something to pin my life on because God's given me purpose. It's destiny. I'm living in destiny. You're living in destiny. What do you think about destiny? What do you think about the future? What lens are you looking through? Are you looking through circumstance tainted lens? Lens? Or are you looking through faith-filled lens? Hope or hopelessness? Jeremiah 29 verse 11, you know it, I know the thoughts. I think toward you, says the Lord, and they're thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope. And that's where I believe we can build and frame our lives and build our belief. Now, Paul also went to Athens, it was in Ephesus. He met Gentiles there and talked about the difference of the hopelessness outside of Christ and what's in Christ. And so writing to those Ephesians and then here in Athens, the Greeks also Gentiles, without God, without hope. And in the middle of all of that is all this philosophy and all of these religious idols and people looking for God. And Paul actually finds, Acts 17 verse 23, he finds a memorial or an inscription, an altar to the unknown God. I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Then I love his boldness. He says then, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, I'm going to preach to you about him. And so he goes into this world, all these Epicureans and Stoic philosophers and all of this pagan worship. And he goes in there boldly introducing them to the God they didn't know. He goes on in verse 26 and onwards. He says, he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. In other words, the promises for us all has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their ceiling. In other words, time and opportunity. God, he has pre-appointed it. 
I love that. But you know, boundaries, that word sometimes, people would start thinking like that. What do you think with boundaries is inexhaustible? Too much air for one bird. Too much water for one fish. Too much grace for one human. I wonder how we think of boundaries. God, He sets the boundary. Let, let, let Him set the boundaries because they'll always be a lot wider than when we set them ourselves. So here's the thing. He says, He's not far from any one of you, talking of God. In Him you live, in Him you move, in Him you have your being. He's saying, Don't, He's not too far. He's close. Basically, our living, our moving, our actual being comes from Him. That's what he's saying to, but you know, I'll tell you about these Epicureans. That's, the scripture talks about the philosophers in Athens, Epicureans and Stoics. Epicureans believe man is a feeling being. In other words, any sense of fulfillment will come out of feeling good. So it's kind of what fills the nightclubs last night here in Sydney or wherever you are. It's people, they're just trying to get a buzz. It's trying to get a buzz out of what they drink, what they take, you know, who they're with. How they dance. I mean, they're just trying to get a buzz. They're trying to, appe to appease their feelings, trying to find something there. Hey, you know what? The Stoics, just like the Epicureans said, man is a feeling being. They believe man is a rational being. So it was all about rationalizing intellect. It's all about ability, if you like, to analyze and to have a reason for everything, have a purpose for everything. Nothing wrong with thinking, not even, nothing wrong with feeling and sometimes feeling great and, you know, being with friends and celebrating. Nothing wrong with any of that, except for when you're without God and without hope. Because that's where you put your hope. And the sad thing is these Epicureans and these Stoics were as helpless, as empty as anyone else. Because they're feeling type thoughts and their thinking type thoughts about what life would be built on was getting them nowhere. Solomon says, ultimately, just put God in place. Then whenever and whatever life brings you, you're ready for it. Grace to grace. Too much air, too much water, too much grace for one person, for one bird, for one fish to explore. <laughs> Gee, I like my preaching. Yeah. <laughs> this is a century. Yeah. I'm going for a double hundred. <laughs> if you don't understand cricket, you have no idea. Oh, number one of what you're missing out on, and number two, <laughs> what this metaphor or analogy even means. You know, David and the Psalms generally, in terrible circumstances, are filled with expectation. Psalm 112 is talking about a righteous man. And this is what it says about him. Verse 6, surely he'll never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of bad news. Evil news, bad news. He's not afraid of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. You ever had that feeling every time the phone rings, your stomach drops? When for 15, 16 years ago, I was getting attacked and we were getting attacked by every media outlet you can think. Every time the phone would ring, every Monday, I'm trying to have my day off and my stomach would drop with this expectation of bad news. But we're going to build our foundation on something different than that. I got up one morning, I'll never forget, and it had just been relentless, people attacking. I mean, they'd never seen a church like this before. It was different for the Australian psyche. And so what you don't understand, you tend to criticize it. It's, we've come a long, long way, a long way when it comes to those things. But I, I will tell you this, one time I got up, and it was my birthday, and I was up early to go to the airport, and it was still dark. I was driving up Glenhaven Road near where I live, and I thought, God, don't let us be on the radio today. Turn the radio on. The first thing I hear is this. The guy says, there's something wrong in the very core of this whole song. You just wait and see. You just wait and see. It's the first thing I heard. And so I got to the point where bad news was framing my mind. Bad news was framing my thinking, living in fear. Oh, I thank God I don't feel like that now. No, I don't feel like that at all because I know God has got it. He's got it at hand. The church has gone forward. It just keeps going from strength to strength to strength to strength. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, listen, hope. There's a door in. Maybe right now you're in tough times. How do you just rebuild your hope? How do you keep hope in a hopeless situation? There's a door into hope. Hosea. Hosea is the guy who, 
he married a harlot. And the whole book is, if you like, speaking to Israel's harlotry. In other words, ultimately, it was addressing their relationship with God, which was a train wreck. And so into that, he says in Hosea 2.15, I will give her vengeance from there. Think of Israel. And the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She'll sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came upon the land of Egypt. It says, the valley of Achor became a door of hope. Achor means trouble. It's literally saying he'll turn the valley of your greatest trouble into a doorway into hope. Listen to the message translation. In the message, I'll give her bouquets of roses. I'll turn heartbreak valley into acres of hope. I'll tell you why Achor was significant. It was the place of Israel's perhaps greatest humiliation, their biggest defeat. They had just, in Joshua's time, they had just won the battle of Jericho. God, of course, delivered them and knocked down the walls and what was an insurmountable object. All of a sudden, they were entering into their inheritance. And then after that, in Achor, they disobeyed God. They didn't do what he said. They did it partially, but they didn't do it all. And the end result is they get to Ai. After Jericho, Ai should have been a cinch. It was a walkover. But they were horribly defeated, horribly humiliated. And it was their greatest, greatest devastation. And so that valley of trouble became a doorway, God saying, God will take your greatest trouble, your greatest heartbreak. I love that thought. He'll take the valley of trouble, whatever said in the message, and turn it into acres of hope, acres of hope, acres of hope. Not just a little hope, not just a little people, acres of hope, acres and acres. Too much hope for one human to enjoy. Too much water for one fish to explore. Too much air for one bird to fly. Too much grace for one person to exhaust. Friends, let's build our lives with a sense of faith and hope and expectation. There is a doorway from heartache and from trouble into hope. When you trust God and you keep Him as your foundation. And here's the other thing. There's a door into hope, but there's also a door out of hope. Because some people, they're locked in hope. In other words, you, you're full of hope. You're full of hope, but it doesn't seem to, you, you're just caught in the hope. It's, it's not realizing anything. You become a prisoner of hope. There's different ways I can translate the idea of being a prisoner of hope. Yeah, I kind of love it because it's a whole lot better than being a prisoner of no hope. But here's what the scripture says. It's in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Hey, maybe you feel like you're locked inside hope. You know, you, you, you've got hope, but it just doesn't seem to have a door out. You're locked there. And he's saying, I'm not just going to do what's been plundered. I'll restore double. That's the promise. And yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus Christ the same. In other words, God is God. And in 2016, God is alive and God is working. And hope and expectation is what should frame our world. And I pray we'll always be a church where hope and expectation frame our world. You see, faith is final. But hope brings eternal. Faith is final. It's like, well, nothing's going to change. That's it. In Ecclesiastes, again, Solomon's anti-wisdom, I guess, to a point. But this is what he says. He says, people and animals are all the same. Everyone dies. Everything dies. And then they go to the ground. You know, people and animals are all the same. But then it changes. Then it actually changes. And he says this. He talks about our soul or our spirit and says it goes upwards. And talking about animals and said it goes downwards. Now, if you are a cat lover or a dog lover, don't let your life be destroyed about thinking your, your cat or your dog might go to hell. Of course, all cats do go to hell. But <laughs> don't let that rule or frame your thinking there. Focus on the other thing. You know, I said last time I was speaking on this, where there's life, there's hope. But the truth is in Christ, where there's death, there's hope. From death to life, from grace to grace. Even in death, there is hope if we build on the right foundation. And that foundation is Jesus. Faith is a world of inevitability. It's a world of inevitability. Hope is a world of possibility. A long, long time ago, 
this prophet guy was preaching in our church long before we were on this property. And he looks up into the balcony of the hall we used to rent called the Hills Center. He points to a couple way up on the third floor up there. And he prophesies a child over them. Well, anyone who was part of our church and knew them knew that they couldn't have children. I think like 17 years or something married couldn't have children. I think, wow, this is great, you know. Yeah, it was great, all right. Just within a very short time, they became pregnant. They had a miracle baby. And you know, some people, that's not your expectation. Or rather, that's not your experience. That's not how it's worked for you. But that's a game where we don't let experience frame our hope and our belief. We let, we let God's Word, God's commandment and our love and our wonder of God frame our hope and our expectation in Jesus' name. The whole point is, when you're told you can never have children, you're infertile, then that's final. Unless God gets involved. Because then all of a sudden, He can bring grace into an impossible situation. You're impossible situation. Faith is, well, just acceptance. Faith is inevitability. Ultimately, faith is fickle. It's indiscriminate. You know, time and chance, we don't, it's not all looking the same. In other words, your opportunity, my opportunity, your day, length of days, my length of days, they may be different. But the one thing I do know is it doesn't have to be ruled by fate because God appoints the times and He sets the boundaries. It's, 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 it's a different kind of expectation. But fate is just fickle. It's indiscriminate. It picks on you. All of a sudden, you start believing. If it's going to happen to anyone, it's going to happen to me. Do you know, today in our state, New South Wales and in Victoria, it's Daylight saving day. In other words, everyone had the good change. We all had an extra hour's sleep. That's why there's a great crowd in the nine o'clock service today. We're just gonna pray there's a great crowd in the next service because some people thought that they were coming for another service because they had an extra hour. By the way, a little footnote, it's amazing how some people, extra hour makes no difference. They still come 20 minutes late, but we're not going there, all right? We're not going there. <laughs> you know, Life conspires against me because I travel a lot, as you know. And I always seem to be away for this Sunday, the good one, where you get the extra hour sleep that I wasted on watching sport last night. But <laughs> two confessions of a pastor. Of course, really, I was praying and believing and <laughs> praying for the service. And it just happened to be that the football was on. But, you know, I always seem to miss this one, but I also, always seem to always get more than one of the bad one, where you've got to be an hour early in the day, where you lose an hour, where literally you've got to get up an hour earlier. I seem to get that in the USA. I get it in Australia. I get it in England. I seem to come across that one. See, life is against me. It's working against me. Ah, listen, I do sometimes think, though, it is interesting. I always seem to mess this one up. However, that's my whole message. Life is not working against you. And even if it is, there is a God that you can build your foundation on. Don't put yourself in the hand of inevitability. Hey, don't allow the fickleness of faith to rule your thinking. Let's be people who understand the power of faith and hope and live our lives with that foundation in our lives. And you'll find that no end is final, that no failure is fatal, that no one is unreachable, that no mistake is unredeemable, which I finished my message with at Easter and I still remember it off by heart. Fantastic. The best. <laughs> you know it. Father, I just thank you for the power of your word. I thank you it does breathe life into our situation and into our circumstance. I thank you, Father, that we can look to a God whose life and whose message and whose resurrection says from death to life, from grace to grace. So much grace that it's inexhaustible. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Come on, let's stand. Let's sing the song together again. Stay with us just a moment, please. I see that grave, I see Jesus. From death to life, I have seen praise. No one can sing. I see that cross, I see Yes. I see that
You know, the Bible teaches us in the New Testament that all Scripture is inspired by God. It literally means that the Word is God-breathed. So God-given hope is God-breathed. I'd love you to do something physical, just a little thing. I'm going to ask everyone in a moment to have a big suck in of hope. One more time, suck in hope. Come on, Victoria. In a hopeless world, He's the God of all hope. Romans 5 verse 5, now hope does not disappoint. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know those verses. Lord, I just believe and people today go out of here that hope will frame their thinking. Lord, no sense of inevitability, no sense of fatalistic, whatever will be, will be. Our God is our God. Look this way for one moment. I wonder if you, all across our church, everywhere we're gathered right now, have ever made a conscious decision to surrender ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've ever encountered Him in a personal way. He loves you. He is for you. He is on your side. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know, the Bible says anyone who calls on God's name, anyone, anyone, no one's too poor, no one's too rich, no one's too bad, no one's too good. All of us, we all are in the same place. We need Christ in our lives. And Jesus Christ is the way to God. He is God. I'd love it to know people make a choice saying, Jesus, I want to make that conscious choice. I want to walk out of here having known I made that decision. I want to encounter you. I want you in my life. I'm just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and I'll pray it with the entire church. We're going to believe for Jesus to come fill people's hearts, fill their lives. And if you say, Brian, when you pray that prayer, that I may make that choice, that I may encounter God, Would you please include me in the prayer? In just a moment, I'm going to ask all of those people everywhere, not just here where I am, but where you are, to raise your hand in the air if that's you. Make a choice that today is the day that when we pray, I believe people today can connect with Jesus in a powerful way. Maybe at some point you prayed a prayer like that, but you kind of lost your way. Somewhere along the way, God doesn't change. He doesn't move. I don't think He's in the business of unsaving people, but we could be making choices that have us cut off from the blessing of God, cut off, alienated from the center of God's will. What a beautiful day for us to make the choice to come back to Him, turn from backsliding, believe for a new start, a brand new chapter. So I'm going to pray that prayer over many, many people today. And if you say, Brian, when you pray for people to encounter Jesus, when you pray for people to make that conscious choice, would you include me in the prayer? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. If you say, when you pray for people to be saved, when you pray for people to be born again, Would you pray for people to fill the God-shaped void in their life by inviting God Himself into my life? Would you include me in that prayer? Brian, when you pray for people to get right with God, to turn from their backsliding, to come back to living out of an ongoing vital relationship with Him, Brian, would you include me in that prayer? Then I would love to pray for you. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask everyone everywhere, just close your eyes, think about where you're at spiritually, and I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to ask every single person everywhere who says, Brian, please include me in that prayer of salvation, of a restored relationship with God, of a new beginning. Brian, include me in that prayer. On three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in the air. I'm believing there's going to be a whole lot of hands, a whole lot of people making this choice today. So you won't be alone. I believe there'll be many of you. So you're ready for that? You're ready to raise your hand? On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Lift them up right now. Lift them up. Wow, I love seeing the hands go up. I love seeing, and of course, through the camera, God sees hands going up and many other campuses and many other services all the way across Hillsong's church and maybe even there, watching on stream, you can be making this choice for Jesus to frame your world, to frame your future, to take you out of hopelessness and into a place of promise. Come on, let's give all those people a great big congratulations. And let's thank God for each and every single one of them. And we're going to pray as a big church family, like we always do. Like we always do toward the end of our service. We pray this prayer with people who are making a choice for Jesus. And if you pr- lifted your hand, or if you're making a decision for Christ today, obviously pray the prayer to God. This is your moment. This is your day. 
This is your appointed time of salvation in Jesus' name. So let's pray this prayer across our church together. Dear Jesus, this is the moment I accept you into my life as Lord and Saviour. From this moment, because of Jesus Christ, my sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God, a new creation, a follower of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for your forgiveness and mercy. I am a believer. Jesus is alive in me. Amen, amen. Go on, give them a big, a big congratulations. I love that moment in the service. I love that moment in the service. All right, Dave, real quick, yes. tell them what happens with this. Basically, if you made that decision today, um, there's going to be people around and about you who... Hey, this is your big moment. Don't let the yeah. pressure get to you. It's getting Don't to me, fluffy I'll be your lines. Don't fluff your lines. I'm like, I my mean, back is sweaty. There's not just this crowd, there's thousands of other people watching you as well. Awesome. Okay, well, if you have, uh, have put your hand up and you prayed that prayer from your heart, um, we've got volunteers and people around and about you that have these uh, Bibles. And if they don't come to you, they don't find you, we definitely have people in the foyer who are going to be waving these Bibles up in the air. Find one of them. Before you even get the words out, they're going to hand it to you. He's better than me. <laughs> this is a triple century right here. Amazing. Best decision you've ever made. Amen. Come on, do what you're called to do from grace to grace. Amen. Here we go. Let's all sing it together. and your smile is upon us. Lord, your face is smiling with your grace and your favour. Lord, I believe for this to be a week for people of experiencing your grace. Lord, I thank you right now that you bless and you keep your people, that your face indeed shines upon them, that you're the ever merciful God, that grace to grace to grace can be our expectation. We give you the praise. We thank you, Father, you're already ahead of us on this journey and into this week. I pray it'll be filled with God-given possibility. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, tonight, church is gonna be great. Come to church here if you're at Hills. Go to church next door, same service. Completely different worship teams, but no A team, no B team. Shared out perfectly. It's going to be an awesome night. Be blessed. Have a great week. No A teams, no B teams. We sing. This is no performance. Lord, I praise, worship. Empty words I can't